Hello, everyone, and welcome to the podcast, Life is a Story We Tell Ourselves. Our guest today is Christina Marks. Christina is a systemic family counselor, a certified trauma specialist, and she founded Horse Guided Empowerment. She's here today to talk about separation anxiety during the pandemic, homeschooling, and more. So welcome to the podcast, Christina. Thank you so much, Don, for having me. It's an honor to be on your podcast, really. Yeah, and it's exciting having you right here in the community. I think this is the first time I've actually had someone on the show that lives in the same community that I do. Oh, um, really? I'm usually, I'm usually people here. <laughs> I know I'm usually doing these uh, remotely. So anyway, this is uh, great to have you on the show. So let me just immediately get into it. Why don't you tell our guests what exactly is Horse Guided Empowerment? Horse Guided Empowerment is a method for coaching and psychotherapy with a herd of horses. And I have created that because, well, my profession is psychology, my passion is horses, and uh, there's different methods for horse-assisted learning out there, but um, I was always missing an important piece, which is the natural horsemanship. And um, so I created that method about 10 years ago, and um, I've had a lot of incredible moments with my clients, with retreat groups, with children, and I'm also teaching that all over the world. So how does it work? What, what do you do exactly with people and the horse? <laughs> well, first of all, we work with several horses at a time and we put them in a big paddock. And um, then we bring the clients into the herd and do some activities to really integrate them so that the horses kind of include them into their social structure. And then the clients share some personal issues, something they wanna work on. And the horses will react to that directly without critical, without being critical, without judgment. And then the practitioner will uh, guide them through questions or activities to get to the root of their problem and to find a new way of dealing with it. Well, let's say someone, let's take something really simple. So if someone says, I'm afraid of heights, I've been afraid of heights all my, all my life, and mm-hmm. it's just bugged me to death, and, and I want to work through that problem. Can, can you do that with the horses? Yes, yes, absolutely. So it's kind of a little bit of like exposure therapy, but we don't have to go to the height in the beginning, but we can use it as a general anxiety problem. We can find out why do you have it? Why is it so important for you? Did you maybe have um, a terrible experience regarding heights or is it something that is purely in your imagination? And then we confront that with the horses. So we might, for example, build an obstacle that uh, represents your fear of height and then you will work through it. And the, the incredible part is that the horses will read what is behind it within you. So mm-hmm. for example, an obstacle that you create, the horses might just cross it if you don't give it any meaning. But if it means your fear of height, then the horses will not cross it if you believe within yourself that it's impossible to overcome. And then we talk about that. I'll ask you open-ended questions. And if you come to the place where you think, well, maybe it is actually possible to overcome, the horses will cross it. Okay, mm-hmm. So their reaction is really directly related to what you are thinking. And that gives me a lot of insight. And you can work through your problem in a very practical way. And you have right away the experience that it is possible. So you go home, not with a theoretical um, in office coaching session where I say, well, now you take it home to your environment, but you have already practiced it in the session. And then you go home with a success experience and then it's a lot easier. So are you saying these horses are psychic? Yes. <laughs> yes. <laughs> yes. No, they can absolutely uh, read our minds and they interpret our emotions, of course, from their um, point of view, but horses will share emotions with their herd over very long distances. So um, if a herd communicates, it's not only through body language, but also through messages, like telepathic messages of emotions. Mm -hmm. And then they will do the same with us and we can also pick it up. So they will come, they they will work with you, they might, 
put their head on your chest or they might lay down next to you and they will send out these emotional messages that will help you or, or any client that is there with me. So you know me well enough. Uh, yes. We <laughs> lived in this community together a long time and uh, I'm the resident uh, scientist. So I have to ask, is there uh, science behind this? Has there been any research uh, behind this to, to demonstrate that there is some actual psychic connection between humans and, and horses. Uh, what can you say about that? Well, uh, there is no science about the telepathic messaging. Uh, there is a lot of different science uh, why the sessions with the horses work. So let me first go into the, the telepathic messaging. Um, if you observe a herd in the wild, a really big one, there could be like 200 horses spread over um, a huge amount of land and they will perceive a threat basically at the same time and they will start moving at the same moment. And it's not possible to um, explain that just by body language because they are too far away and they're not observing each other all the time, they're grazing. But if something happens, if one horse gets scared, all of them will raise their head and all of them will decide together if it's a threat or if it's okay to go back to grazing. And the only way to explain it is through some kind of of waves or, or kind of telepathic messaging. So that's my, my explanation for that. I have seen it with, uh, with people several times, but then there is other, other reasons that are scientifically explain, explicable uh, to why the sessions work. So one thing is uh, just pure body language. Mm -hmm. If you're in, a, in an office and you're sitting across from your therapist, you usually have a very um, closed body language, you're probably crossing your legs, you're making yourself small, and that's not helpful for learning. So out in the field with the horses, we have a very upright posture, we open our chest, and uh, that gives us more possibility to go deeper into the learning experience. And then there is evidence that the human heart rate uh, will lower when in contact with the horses, they have a very low heart rate because they're in a relaxed state, which is very important for my method. They have to be relaxed and in a natural environment. I don't work with horses that come out of a, out of a stall, out of a small box. And um, so the human nature will, um, the human nature is, um, is, I'm missing a word here. <laughs> Um, our human body will adapt to our surroundings. So if you're sitting next to somebody who's, who's very nervous, you will probably become nervous too, or the other person will adapt to your tranquil state of mind. And that also uh, happens with the horses. They have a very big heart and the magnetic field that is transmitted by their heart through their heart rate is something that will influence our own heart rate. So there's a piece of, of scientific information for you and then we have all the the brain chemistry i mean you know that that positive touch will uh, release um, oxytocin and serotonin and it will lower co cholesterol in our blood and that's what we do out there so the clients will touch the horses they create a very positive relationship with them um, they don't feel judged they can open up so there's a lot of things that that helped me in that direction. Are you, are you okay with that? Well, you know, I'm absolutely okay with that. And, and as you know, I've spent my entire life around horses uh, as well. So um, I understand a lot of what you're saying and a lot of my interaction and feeling with horses certainly wasn't uh, necessarily scientific, but it was very uh, empirical. And I spent, you know, hours and hours in the, in the back country, if not days and days on horseback and uh, I can tell you that uh, horses uh, do exhibit uh, some sort of psychic uh, ability and there is a bonding that, that goes on, on between someone and uh, their horse and me being a horse patrol ranger and my daughters all having horses and having that experience. Um, I can certainly verify a lot of what you're saying, uh, but I have to ask, I had to ask about the, the science because some of this yeah. stuff is kind of out there. And, uh, but um, I guess you would say in the end, at the end of the day, the proof is in the pudding. How do your clients come out of this is, is what uh, is really important. 
Yes, you're right. And a lot of people who are around horses or horseback riding uh, know that and have experienced that kind of connection. But still, for me, it's very important to also include some of the scientific evidence and to always study everything that is out there, because it, it is actually there is scientific evidence. It's um, it has a solid uh, theoretical foundation and it's not about girls and horses having some magical connection and the unicorns <laughs> coming down from you know it's it, it has a lot of background and it's very important for me to also transmit that to my to my students and to my clients and um i believe both parts together make it a really great method and of course the, the experiences that i see with my clients are are just fantastic and very rewarding also well, this is fascinating to me, and I, my, my, what I'm really curious about is, uh, did you have uh, some sort of, you know, transcendent or even mystical experience as a result of your interaction with the horses in therapy? Has something ever happened to you that, you, that was unexpected uh, as a result of your, your uh, practicing this horse-guided empowerment? Uh, yes, absolutely. And, um, and I don't even know which one to pick. <laughs> there are so many, so many transcendental experiences that I have had. So, for example, I, um, I work with uh, rescue horses. So I receive horses that have had some kind of trauma or were abandoned. And then I rehabilitate them. And um, they also get to work with my clients. So one thing that happened very early on, like, I don't know, almost 10 years ago, I think, um, was when I received a rescue mare with a small uh, foal and uh, she was in such a bad shape. She had wounds, open wounds all over her body and she was very malnourished and skinny and frightened and she had a, a rope around her neck that we couldn't even cut off because she wouldn't let us near her. And um, I've had her in the, in the pasture with a couple of other horses and I had a session with a teenager and um, usually the session starts out with greeting the horses and then maybe picking one that is interesting for you today or that has something common with you or, or that is just calling you in some, some way, right? So I said that to the girl and in the same moment I said, oh, that was such a big mistake. Like, why did I leave that mare here knowing that she would not be able to touch her? And uh, that could be really frustrating for that teenager, but well, it was too late. So she went out, she was greeting the horses. She walked up to that horse, not knowing her history and patted her on the neck. And the horse was standing still while we were trying the days before that in all possible manners to get close to that horse. So that teenager just walked up to her and petted her and stood there for a while. And then she came back and said, well, this horse, this, this one over there, the big white one, she is kind of like me. So, so she needs a lot of space for herself and, and she needs to, to have some quiet time. So just, just leave her alone for a while. I need that too sometimes. And I was blown away. <laughs> like I, I have seen a lot of Whoa. like, love connections or, or horses laying down, which is something very unusual. I mean, if you have a client there and then all the horses, seven horses will lay down around you. That's just, that's just magical. It's mm -hmm. incredible to see that. But that was the first time that I saw how the horses will actually react to our, um, to our inner world and even put their own issues aside because somebody else needed it more so that girl didn't she was not a threat for the horse she was a victim herself and the horse just accepted her in a totally different way than it did several other people and and you know horse people um i i think i know a lot about rehabilitation and i could not get close to her and that girl just um just did it and mm -hmm. um so that taught me that every encounter of the client and the horse is unpredictable. I will not know how that goes beforehand. And it's unique every time the horses will react to who you are right now and what you are bringing into the session and into the paddock 
and um and that's just uh that's just mind-blowing so many times that's absolutely fascinating what a wonderful story i was sitting here spellbind that's that uh gives you chills and, and you're spreading this uh horse guided empowerment uh around the world into other countries i know you recently were in dubai uh, yes offering that training was, what can you tell us yeah. about that that what was, was a that like? way i have uh, i have traveled i've done courses in germany and in latin america and i've had students from many other countries but um this time I was contacted by a German woman who lives in Dubai and she had heard about me and uh, she actually knew about horse coaching and had done it in a different way. But then she had found a herd in an oasis, which is living there almost untouched. So it, it's a, it's a former breeding barn, but they're not breeding anymore for, I don't know, like 15 years or something. So there were 40 horses untouched, <laughs> uneducated. And um, so she was looking for somebody who had a more a, a free approach to it, where the horses could actually be horses, where they didn't have to be haltered, where they didn't have to work with, you know, weird equipment. And, uh, and she found me and then we put the course together and it was, uh, it was incredible in that oasis working with uh, 40 head herd of Arabian mares um, mm. and, and like, you know, interesting, very, very good breed, very, um, I'm, I'm not very much into, into special breeds or, or, you know, like bloodlines and all of that. I know nothing about it, but you could see that those horses were, were special. They were different and they were all coming from the same bloodline. So, uh, it was a it was a very interesting situation, and in Dubai there's a lot of horse people. Um, there's a lot of racing and endurance racing, but it's all very classical. So for them, looking at the horse as this sentient being that can actually respond to your emotional landscape was something really new for them. And um, we have one one um, moment there when we were practicing an activity where you ride bareback. So you just put the client bareback on the horse and then they turn around and they lay down um, with the, and connect with the belly and with the horse and with the chakras and relax. And they were so scared. <laughs> like, oh my <laughs> God, without a saddle and this is so dangerous. I'm like, well, you know, let's just go slowly, little by little, you'll see it's not dangerous. And, um, and it was interesting how, how they're, their anxious, um, anxious emotions also kind of, you know, troubled the situation. So the horse was a bit scared, didn't know what was going on. And I had to switch the participants several times until I found somebody who actually thought that was possible right. <laughs> so that we could right. practice it. Yes. <laughs> that really is uh, fascinating. And I know you took one of your sons with you, didn't you? Yes, the two older ones uh, came with me. And, and did they participate there. as well? <laughs> well, they had a they had an incredible time. I mean, Dubai is there the city, the modern city, and then and then you leave the city and you're just in the desert and there's nothing else, just sand and some random camels. <laughs> that was that was fascinating. Well, the reason I mentioned your sons, and we'll talk about this a later in the show, is I know you homeschool your uh, your three sons, mm -hmm. and. Um, I know this is probably part of um, how you socialize them and, and uh, part of the, the whole process of, of homeschooling them as well. And we'll talk about that um, a little bit later. Mm -hmm. uh, but that's a, a good segue to, to talk about um, this whole pandemic and uh, isolation, sheltering in place and the anxiety that it's uh, led to, separation anxiety. We start hearing all of these psychological words, I guess, mm -hmm. have now become part of the everyday uh, lexicon. And so maybe you can help us understand what exactly is separation anxiety and also does uh, this horse guided empowerment help uh, with the therapy with people that may have uh, this, these, these anxieties associated with sheltering yeah. in place and isolation? Yeah, well, um, 
the I, I was just talking about the whole anxiety topic yesterday on another uh, in, uh, interview and um, it's really a lot worse than than most people think because there are so many um, so many elements that contribute to aggravating the situation so one is people are locked in they are uh, doing less exercise they have less sunlight they have less nature experiences and of course less connection so that um uh, have you ever heard about the polyvagal theory no i have not what is enlighten so, us <laughs> yeah well it's a it's a quite a complex uh neuroscientific uh, topic so if people want to get into it there is a lot that you can read out there about the polyvagal theory and um well you know shortened it says that positive and predictable human connection will help us to go away from our um, instinctive responses to a threat so instinctively we would fight or flight or freeze right that's the that's the biological response to a threat and uh, through personal connection and predictable personal connection, we can switch on our logical mind and we can actually ask for help and find uh, support in a group through human connection. And um, so now that's not possible. <laughs> we don't have that, that possibility for human connection and um, that brings us to like a state of hyper arousal, which is not, um, that cannot be sustained for a very long time. And it translates into something very similar to post-traumatic stress disorder, which um, it's called chronic threat response. People who live in war zones have the same issues. So you're constantly in a state of hyper arousal and uh, that causes sleep problems and anxiety and irritability and the lack of concentration. And on the long run, this, this feeling of, well, I, I can't do anything about that and, and even suicidal thoughts. So uh, there, is a, there is really a pandemic of anxiety out there. And um, I also believe that it has a lot to do just with the limited possibility of positive touch that we have. So people are starting to use, you know, like Zoom video conferences and all that to connect with their friends and loved ones. But um, if you think about the amount of positive touch that we usually have in a normal day, so you would handshake with your neighbor maybe, or you would hug a friend, or somebody at work would like pet your shoulder, or just, you know, all these small things contribute to our um, emotional well-being. It's motivating, it's, it's reassuring. Um, the positive tactile experience will bring our cortisol down. And now all this is just taken away from us. And then we also have the masks. So if we get into contact with somebody, if we talk to, you know, somebody in the store or in the cor at the corner, um, we usually, our, our nervous system will interpret the facial features with the smile, of course, and also the voice tone to determine if an interaction is positive and safe or not. Now, maybe you know that your neighbor is not a threat, but your, your nervous system has this moment of, I can't interpret this. I don't understand it. I don't see this the face, I don't see the smile, the voice is kind of like weird, through the mask. <laughs> well, you and know, that's a, it's interesting that you're saying that. If I can interrupt for a second. I now have found myself, I mean, actively looking at the face of a person to see if they're smiling or if they're frowning. I'm trying desperately, seriously, actively trying to pick up those those kind of things. And it actually frustrates me that I, I can't tell if they're smiling or I can't tell if they're frowning or, or how they react to me. And, and it causes a weird feeling inside of me because I, yes. I don't know what's going on. Yes, exactly. That's exactly how you describe it. So even for somebody who never had any anxiety issues, um, you feel weird and you don't even know why. So that's, that's one of the explanations. And it's, um, I think it's far worse than we all think it is. Mm -hmm. Wow, that's amazing. So now back to the 
horse uh, empowerment. Mm -hmm. um, I know here in the community, you have talked to people about um, if they have a need coming to you and uh, participating in the um, equine therapy, as I call it, my word. Um, mm -hmm. And uh, how does that work? Have, have, have you gotten positive results? Um, well, we are uh, back to working with the kids. We had a, a therapy program for uh, over 60 families with the horses. Um, and it's, it's not the pure horse guided empowerment because we also do have them ride and we do a lot of different exercises and there's special needs kids as well. So I call it a holistic equine therapy. It's a mixture of, of both things. And we are getting back to that and, uh, and had a lot of very positive results. The kids, I mean, the kids kind of disappeared from the planet. Um, yeah. They were not allowed in the supermarket. So I don't know how like single mothers with uh, little kids would even go shopping. So it's, um, it's, it's quite dramatic for a lot of people. And uh, then imagine special needs kids, they completely fall through all the online classes. It's not possible to work with them online with most of them. So they are just locked in and uh, they don't have any stimulus uh, apart from their family. So bringing them back to the horses was really important for us. And I also have some, some adult clients who deal with anxiety specifically or depression. And uh, if you just imagine the situation, like we're, we're out there, we're out in nature. So there's sun and nature and a calming environment. And then you can, in very little time, create a positive relationship with the animals. So you have a very positive sensory stimulation going on, tactile also, of course, visual and, and all of that. And then, um, so, so a lot of the things that, that we're lacking with the connection and with going outside and all of that, that's, um, that's just uh, naturally possible with the horses. We're in a big field. Maybe we don't even need masks. There's nobody around. Uh, just you and the horse and I'm, you know, at the other part of the field, maybe. Mm -hmm. And um, so that the experience, the whole experience is really calming and positive for the clients and it helps them to regulate their nervous system. Yeah, and relieves a lot of that anxiety. I, I can see that. <laughs> well, some of this anxiety, and this is another, you know, segue into a slightly different subject, but it's, it's certainly related you know, children being out of school and you talk about them having disappeared. I mean, it's the one thing we notice in this community. I look around and I'm like, where, where are the kids? Yeah. And well, you, you know where I live. And there were, of course, a parade of children every day on their way to school yeah. passing my house. And I, I don't see children at all anymore. So these children um, are at home. They're there all day. Uh, they're around their parents and uh, there are toddlers underfoot if they're not in daycare any longer. Uh, work schedules have been uh, disrupted. Uh, family routines are, are disrupted. And so all of that sort of combines into this psychic jumble. I'm not a psychologist, so I'll just call it a psychic jumble that has everyone um, you know, confused, but especially the relationship between children uh, and their uh, parents. Mm -hmm. And I'd uh, just like for you to comment maybe and say a few words about this interaction with children and their parents, especially since you homeschool your children. And, and so you're with them all the time. You work from home a lot. Uh, so mm -hmm. what's that experience like? And do you have any advice for, for parents in this, this different situation? Whole new yeah. paradigm. Well, so first of all, in, in all this during all this time of the quarantine and the lockdown, I have been working with a lot of counseling clients uh, through Zoom and also with kids and especially teenagers. We have the, I have the fantastic situation that a local foundation, the Lexi Drake Foundation is supporting uh, my work so I can offer free, free sessions to, to low income or underprivileged families. And um, I have talked to a lot of teenagers who actually did not leave their house for several months. Mm -hmm. And when they do, just to you know, visit somebody or to go back to the store at some point, um, they, are, they are lost. They, everything is new. They, are, they don't understand the rules. 
they feel threatened just by getting out of their house. And um, it's normal because the human nature is, um, is a routine nature. Like we get used to what we're doing or what we're not doing. So if you stop leaving the house for two months, um, then it's gonna hard to do it again. And uh, you compared it to my situation. I have uh, teenagers, my sons are 10 and 13 and 15, but um, we spend a lot of time together always. And we get along really well and we talk a lot, but most other families don't do that. So when they have teenage children, there is a huge disconnect between the parents and the teenagers. They go about their own business. They don't talk about personal stuff. The teenagers will connect to their, to their peers, to their friends, and they will really talk to their parents. Now, if you take that away from them, then um, they are just locked in in a place where they are not necessarily comfortable. Parents don't know what's going on. They don't know how to react to that. And then the teenagers very quickly uh, spiral into depression and suicidal thoughts. They think that their life is kind of over. It's, um, I had that especially with children or with teenagers in their graduation year. So mm -hmm. in that complicated time where you have to decide what you're going to do and you need the support of your peers and you maybe want to plan a graduation party and then none of that is happening. They feel like, well, school is over and nothing else is going to happen and nothing good is going to happen because everything is kind of at halt. And um, it's, it's definitely complicating um, to work with them and through Zoom. While I've seen that kids are a bit better in using the screen also for emotional moments and for, for feelings. Adults are more used to, you know, screen is TV or is maybe video games, but it's not, you're not opening up, you're not sharing real emotions. And the right. teenagers do that more, so they're a bit more used to that. And uh, that has helped me. But uh, the situation is, is really, is really uh, scary, I'd say. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. So in homeschooling your, your children, I mean, you've done it on a regular basis. Uh, do you have any uh, advice for parents that are entering into this for the first time and um, don't have any background or experience with, with their with homeschooling, especially uh, with the, the fact that many times people plant fears in the parents, well, your kids aren't going to be socialized, they're going to be isolated, uh, yeah. and homeschooling may be a bad thing. Uh, what can you tell parents about your yeah. experience with homeschooling? Well, first of all, I think we have to decide uh, what kind of homeschooling we're going to do. So if you try to recreate a school environment at home, doing the same curriculum or the same lesson plan, let's say in the morning math and then language and then sports and then music and you know all these different subjects they have packed into a day and then every day for six or seven hours, uh, recreating that at home is a nightmare from, mm -hmm. from my own experience. It's yes. um, the, the positive part or the, the fun part about homeschooling is that you can mix a lot of subjects into each other. So, I mean, we could, we could read about space travel and then we have language and reading as well as science in one single subject. And then maybe we could put some math into it and calculate, I don't know, the distance between moon and earth or whatever. And then we could do some social studies and find out about astronauts life or um, some, you know, career planning or whatever you want. So, so that's the fun part to combine the subjects. And I have always tried to find uh, interesting subjects that don't come from a school book. So what we do right now a lot is masterclass. It's a new platform online where experts in their field will give a class about their life, about their job. And there is, for example, an astronaut. There is, uh, you know, gourmet cooks and uh, wine experts. And there is mm -hmm. business people. And we have learned a lot through these classes. And, uh, and then it's fun. And then you can do it together. Because if I have to read a science book, a seventh grade science book, again, 
<laughs> it's going to be boring. <laughs> you know, I don't want to do this. But if I can watch a fun and interesting masterclass with my kids and then turn it into schoolwork, then it's really, it's really interesting. And we spend quality time together and we learn something new and we still advance in the curriculum. So, so I can recommend to all the parents out there, put the subjects that you cannot teach or that you know nothing about, like for me, math. Mm -hmm. <laughs> I check out at fifth grade. So my kids have an online class that does everything for them. It's a video lesson. They do the testing and everything there. And I don't have to be involved. And that's really helpful for me. <laughs> well, you do the same thing with chemistry because you send them to me. <laughs> yes, exactly. <laughs> so, so I have found teachers like you, you're a wonderful, inspiring teacher for science and, and a lot of other, like gardening. They always right, talk yeah, about the gardening. <laughs> and, and, and planting. And right. then I have another a class with another sub, uh, teacher here, uh, Deb, uh, from the community. She does art and language. And uh, it's not following a curriculum, but she's, she's like picking their, their, um, their, their uh, abilities and, and also maybe their, their problems, picking them up very gently and then turning them into, into a very relaxed learning environment where they just naturally progress without having to go through, you know, like failure and stress and, and right. pressure and all of that so right. exactly. so if you but i mean it's stressful sometimes for the parents because there are moments when you think that you're not doing any school <laughs> mm -hmm. exactly. and then i have to like write it down and write down okay so today we discussed i don't know the well we did a lot of the space stuff actually mm -hmm. <laughs> space travel space exploration um life on mars um, we talked about that during the entire week. So science checked. Then they went to Don and had their chemistry lesson and did some math. And then they completed their, um, their task in the online course for math. And then we also uh, discussed a book they were reading and then we were cooking and we had to calculate the ingredients and all of that is school right. for me. Exactly. No, that's, that's absolutely true. Well, those are, it, I think that's uh, some good advice. And I think uh, if parents understand that they can, they can learn that if an integrated approach to education uh, relieves, relieves a lot of stress. We homeschooled, of course, all of our, our children. My oldest daughter is your age, and she was, um, she was homeschooled, and she's a doctor now. And, oh, wow. Okay. Uh, that's good. <laughs> so, I mean, there's, there's just wonderful uh, experiences that, and education that children can mm -hmm. uh, have as a result of, of homeschooling and parents really shouldn't be afraid of it. And they, they can find their own way and it just takes some time. Exactly. And, but, if you re but if you relax into it and yeah. also let your children be your guide. I mean, for example, your youngest son, when he came to the first chemistry class, he defined what we first talked about because he had this awesome question about where do the northern lights come from? What is the aurora borealis? But then that led to us easing into yeah. talking about uh, some very fundamental things about chemical interactions in the atmosphere. And um, So if you let your kids be your guide, um, also uh, the teaching becomes a lot easier. Yes, absolutely. And I believe that the world is changing so quickly. I mean, we have, <laughs> we're now experiencing it firsthand. So what we need is a generation of thinkers and researchers and lifelong learners. And, um, and sometimes school will really um, not, not really um, give them a, a lot of passion about learning. Right. And, um, and I believe that's the most important the most important part that I can really give them during their school time that they are interested in, in research and understanding the internet, which information is important and which one is not and why, how would you find out? Exactly. And how would you, how would you analyze, I don't know, a YouTube video that explains about whatever you want <laughs> and, uh, and is maybe just crap. And, um, how, how can they find reliable sources? So I believe that's way more important than following a textbook 
that was, uh, you know, created also for so many different environments and so many different backgrounds, um, I believe. It's well, you're talking about critical thinking, you know, that it allows, you know, for expanding of the mind and doing some critical thinking. I just mentioned the mind and it reminded me, I wanted to ask you final question. So yeah. do you consider yourself a horse whisperer? <laughs> well, I've been, I've been called a horse whisperer uh, several times. And um, yes, I probably am because I do, I do like to, to find out what my horses or what horses in general, uh, what they need, what they lack, how I can give it to them. So it's not so much like whispering in their ear, but creating uh, an environment and also a learning environment for them that is helpful for their innate character. So you have horses that are um, um, dominant horses or introvert horses or uh, extrovert horses. There's a lot, a little bit of everything, just like our human characters. So for everyone, if you wanna teach something, it has to go about a different route. They don't learn the same way and they are stressed by different things. I have one mare in my herd who wants a very controlled and calm environment. She gets stressed with too many horses and too many people because she was brought up that way. So we're just slowly making her a little braver and a little more outgoing, but she just needs a lot of alone time. And then there's others who need constant interaction and new stuff and interesting things to explore. And they get bored if I don't have them in a big field with you know a forest and, and hills and a lot of horses, they just get bored. So so it's about you know getting each one of them what they need and the possibilities that we we have of course, and um, and also use that to create positive experiences for my client because having several horses is uh, a lot of investment. <laughs> <laughs> mm -hmm. And sometimes, sometimes it's really hard to, to afford that, especially the rescue horses have all kinds of issues. And, and fortunately, our amazing community in Kodakachi has, has helped with that. I have received donations to take care of injured horses and everything. So, um, so yeah, it's, a, it's, a, it's an everyday challenge, really, but it's also incredibly rewarding. Well, whether you are a horse whisperer or not, one thing I think we can say is that you have a, a deep and abiding uh, love for horses that you have turned into um, a service uh, to humanity. Thank you, Christina, for, for joining us. This has really been en enlightening uh, for me and, and for our listeners. And um, we'll have you back again sometime. Thank you. Thank you so much, Don. Yes, thank you so much. It was a very fun conversation. It's always it's always amazing and interesting and, and enlightening and motivating to talk to you. So, uh, <laughs> yes, I'd be happy to be back here. And, well, for those who are listening to the podcast and are close to where we live in Kodakachi, um, please reach out and have your own phenomenal experience with my herd. I should mention uh, to our listeners, because this goes, of course, these podcasts go all over the world, that Kodakachi is in Ecuador in South America. So... Mm -hmm. uh, <laughs> But you're yeah. always welcome to come in and join us. Thank you, well, Christina. Or, or, yes, or reach out to me because we have we also have practitioners in the Arabian world, in other countries in South America, in Germany. There's one in Canada. So um, yeah. maybe we have somebody just around your corner. <laughs> <laughs> oh, great. Well, you have a wonderful rest of the day and uh, hug one of your horses for me. Thank you, Christina. Okay, I will. <laughs> Thank you, Don. You too. Have a nice afternoon. All right. Thank you all for joining us on this episode of Life is a Story We Tell Ourselves. Please subscribe to the podcast, and you can find out more about the podcast at lifeisastorypodcast.com. From our family to yours, stay safe, share happiness, and remember, the important thing is to never stop questioning. Curiosity has its own reason for existing.